Welcome to the Gibbstown Frack Gas Export Terminal Exposed. This is a Zoom forum uh, and Delaware Riverkeeper Network uh, and Empower New Jersey are hosting this forum. My name is Tracy Carluccio. I'm Deputy Director of Delaware Riverkeeper Network. We're going to be recording this Zoom forum, so it will be available for future uh, watching. Um, as we move through the presentation, please write your questions into the chat box so we'll have them handy when we begin the question and answer period after all of the presenters have completed their presentation. This is one Zoom forum in a series and we're going to be discussing some of the other ones that we're having this summer. Um, but this one is sort of an introduction to the issue and some very interesting information that is surfaced in recent weeks. Today, we have four presenters, and they are covering different aspects of the proposed Gibbstown liquefied natural gas export terminal. Um, the first is gonna be myself covering the, the basics. Next is Doug O'Malley from Environment New Jersey, and he's gonna be talking about the liquefied natural gas handling issues and the hazards associated with that. Next, we have Jeff Tittle of New Jersey Sierra Club, and he will be talking about the public opposition throughout the supply chain, particularly focusing on Puerto Rico and where they want to build the same company, New Fortress Energy, an import terminal for the liquefied natural gas from Gibbstown. And we have Jocelyn Sawyer from Food and Water Action, and she will be covering the climate issues and about ending fossil fuel development and developing a green new deal, a green recovery. So I also want you to know that I will briefly be introducing after the presentation, a new interactive map that Delaware Riverkeeper Network um, is publishing today. And it shows the transportation routes that are the most likely to be used from Wyalusen, Pennsylvania, where the frack gas would be liquefied at a processing plant down to Gibbstown. And then we'll have our questions and answers and we're gonna be discussing at the very end actions and upcoming events. We have several things going on right now that you can get involved in. Okay, so starting out, um, I'd like to begin by discussing and taking a, a little better look at the Gibbstown Terminal. Delaware River Partners is a subsidiary of New Fortress Energy. And New Fortress Energy originally billed this project in 2017 as one dock with one ship berth for automobiles and dry and refrigerated cargo and some natural gas liquids that would be stored in an old cavern on the site that was built by DuPont decades ago for use in their explosive manufacturing that they did on the site for over 100 years. That X that you see right here, that X is where the Gibbstown Logistics Center is located. It's right, it's, this is Greenwich Township in Gloucester County, New Jersey. Here's Camden up here, here's Philadelphia. This is Chester, PA, across the river and Tinicum Township directly across the river. So what we have found out in a classic bait and switch um, and what has come to, to us to be very clear is the standard operating procedure of New Fortress Energy is that the company was clandestinely moving ahead with building a much larger facility to export liquefied natural gas to be shipped overseas for sale even back in 2017. And adding the liquefied natural gas to be shipped overseas uh, would require a second dock and would triple the potential activity originally approved. This transforms the original Gibbstown Logistics Center into the first LNG export terminal of its kind in the United States and the first LNG export facility on the Delaware River and the first in New Jersey. This project would also be the first to liquefy shale gas out in Pennsylvania's Marcellus Shale region, Bradford County, Wyalusing, and transport it by truck and or by rail through unsuspecting communities over 200 miles to Gibbstown. 
up to 1,650 truck trips per day would carry this dangerous, classified as hazardous and potentially explosive LNG and natural gas liquids into Gibbstown. And up to 100 rail cars loaded with LNG would enter the site each day, according to their permits. There, it would be directly loaded, what they call transloading, onto, an, onto enormous LNG shipping vessels round the clock, 365 days a year at breakneck speed to meet New Fortress's financial forecast for how much they wanna sell. Permits show about 5 million gallons of LNG per day being exported, and additional volumes of natural gas liquids such as butane and propane from the first dock, all to go down the Delaware River, past Wilmington and the Delaware and New Jersey Bay Shores and out into the ocean to foreign ports. The construction of Dock 2 for the LNG export would require dredging of 45 acres of river, impacting water quality and harming fish and aquatic life, including federally endangered Atlantic and short-nosed sturgeon, and also harming and destroying, in some cases, rare and important animals and plants in that area. The terminal adjoins the backyards of the people of Gibbstown. It's only 2.7 miles from Chester, Pennsylvania, the nearest dense urban area and an environmental justice community. It's 1.9 miles from the Philadelphia airport and about a 15 minute ride south of Philadelphia. New Fortress Energy pulled enough strings to get a special federal permit to allow them to transport LNG by rail car in tank cars designed 50 years ago and never used for LNG and never tested for LNG, the unique properties of LNG that you're gonna hear about in a few minutes. So this is another first. This special permit can only be used by New Fortress Energy's subsidiary, Energy Transport Solutions, to transport LNG from Wyalusing, PA to Gibbstown. We'll be showing a map a little later in this form to show you that route and the huge gamble it takes on the lives of people in hundreds of communities along the way. And as a side note, the Trump administration issued an executive order demanding liquefied natural gas be hurriedly approved for rail transport. And we think that was, what behind, was behind the special permit that New Fortress Energy received. And just a few days ago, the Pipeline and Hazardous Material Safety Administration and the Federal Railroad Administration approved LNG by rail car by any rail carrier anywhere in the United States. So that means bomb trains streaming all over the US. There's talk of appealing that. There's a big fight set up against that. And we are fighting this project. Delaware Riverkeeper Network is appealing all three major permits for the terminal. We're in court on all three of them. Empower New Jersey with over 100, mem 100 member organizations um, is involved in the fight up front. And organizations from throughout the four watershed states in the Delaware River watershed, that's New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware, are also involved, such as Catskill Mountain Keeper and Damascus Citizens for Sustainability, Delaware Sierra Club, League of Women Voters of Delaware. And 128 organizations signed a letter to the DRBC last week calling for them to vote against the LNG export terminal. They're the major permit for the project. Without their approval, the project cannot move ahead. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Doug. Uh, Doug, are you available? Yep, I'm, I'm here, Tracy. Okay, great. I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn it over to you so you can discuss uh, the unique uh, disaster uh, properties of liquefied natural gas. Oh, man. You know what? Uh, what an assignment here, Tracy. Uh, because, Pardon? You know, what an can, can you first off? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, just speak up a little bit, Doug. Sure, sure. So I'll, I'll try to be clear here, and, and apologies, I have a little bit of uh, background noise here. My, my kids are in the, the back seat here. Um, you know, I, I want to start off by saying that um, you know I'm incredibly honored just to be joined by everyone on the call, and then obviously by by the organizations, Delaware River Keeper Network, Sierra Club, uh, as well as Food and Water Watch. Um, you know, we are, we have obviously been working on this issue for, you know, now over a year since it was first, uh, you know, plopped onto the lap of the Delaware Basin Commission. 
in literally, uh, you know, notice of, of nearly a few days. Um, I, I want to talk here specifically about LNG as a, as a cargo risk and unique disaster potentials of liquefied natural gas. Uh, you know, essentially, if, if people remember the old George Clooney flick from, you know, 2005, it's called Syriana. At the very conclusion of the movie, and hopefully I'm not giving out too many spoilers, there's a massive explosion that's meant to illustrate the explosive potential of LNG. And of course, the problem is that even Hollywood can't fully capture you know, how devastating an LNG explosion would be. I'm sorry, I just want to walk through just some of the properties uh, of liquefied natural gas. One is that uh, there's, there's no odor, there's no color, so unlike propane, there's no odor and added, so you can't kind of smell uh, liquefied natural gas. It's not, it's not, it's not kind of a, a gas. It's not a gas leak in the way that we think of it. Um, two, obviously, it's liquefied, so it's kept, it's frozen at 260 degrees below, Fahr you know, negative Fahrenheit. So that's that's not you know within our kind of realm of understanding. But what that means is that it's very vulnerable. And so we have a transportation system right now that's set up for this particular facility. Um, and Tracy will talk about this more. This isn't just one location. This isn't just about Gibbstown, New Jersey. It's not about one county or even one state, but this is also about the embrittlement of our transportation uh, infrastructure, our roads, our bridges. Um, you know, this is, uh, you know, obviously places that are rigged, whether it's on a real car or whether it's on a truck, uh, you know, there's a huge danger of liquefied natural gas uh, being disturbed. Um, once a release happens, you can't, it's not like an oil leak, right? It can't be capped or stopped. It's going to get out. And then it's going to boil furiously into a vapor cloud that's 620 times larger than the container. So the potential for this to expand is massive. It's, it's hard to, quote, unquote, contain uh, an LNG explosion. And then if it is ignited, you get what you saw in Syriana, just a massive fireball. And this is where, from a kind of an emergency um, perspective, emergency response perspective, you can't really plan for this. You know, you talk about ev uh, evacuation zones of a mile or two miles. You know, you talk to um, departments on the ground. That is not sufficient. This is not, this would, this would not be a small explosion. Um, I also just wanted to just talk uh, briefly on the, on the fact that um, when, we, when we talk about expert reports, on LNG, we you know really see um, you know a you know, we we see the you know when when we have had disasters they're really bad so it doesn't happen very often but it's not just in kind of Hollywood movies right so um, in Spain there were uh, two trucks um, that that burned uh, two LNG trucks and I, I believe this is on the the next slide uh, Tracy so if you can advance it yeah. Um, there, were, there were two LNG trucks in Spain that burned and then exploded, and the fireball radiation and missiles were thrown 200 feet. I kind of think of this as, you know, a you, you, there's no good accidents, right? But uh, Fred Millar, who's kind of the preeminent expert on liquefied natural gas, um, you know, can recite again and again global instances. And sometimes you have, quote, quote small accidents, uh, but obviously some of those accidents really are um, are, are you know bigger than just what we what we saw here for 200 feet? And just to kind of reiterate, um, in 2016, the U.S. Emergency Response Guidebook advi advises fire chiefs to initially to evacuate one mile, but no federal field re research has been done to show how far the vapor cloud can move. Um, so, in the most recent serious uh, accident um, out in Plymouth, Washington. The, uh, they evacuated, it wasn't just a mile, they evacuated a two mile radius. And so, you know, the you issue know, here is, okay, what's within the two mile radius? What's within the two mile radius of this proposed facility in Gibbstown? Obviously, this is not somewhere out in the middle of nowhere. This is a, a residential community. And then I think as importantly too, when we're thinking about uh, the impacts, uh, you know, this is not, you know, the LNG just doesn't magically show up I mean, in Gibbstown, it's coming, and, and we'll see this in interactive map, it's coming all the way from Wyalusing, all the way up in north central PA. And I think it's important for us, most people have not been to Wyalusing, if, you, you know, if you're you know, kind of a fan of getting, getting outdoors, um, it's a beautiful place. It's not that far from here, depending on where you are in central Jersey, it's like a four hour drive. I, I actually was uh, planning to go up 
to Bradford County for a camping trip uh, in pre-COVID eras uh, earlier this month in Tawanda in Bradford County. Why Loosing is right along the Susquehanna River. So when we're kind of talking about places that are vulnerable, right, it's not just in Gibbstown, it's not just New Jersey, it's also a, a community in north central Pennsylvania, and then specifically um, the impacts on that community and the impacts of the transportation. So you're looking at a 200 mile plus transportation route that's going to carry liquefied natural gas uh, from Wyalusing down through Pennsylvania and then across the river to Gibbstown. And so this is going to create massive industrialization in uh, Wyalusing Township, which is obviously very rural on the Susquehanna. Um, and then the processing plant, the new fortress, we'll hear more about new fortress a little later, it, that's going to be built um, would be huge. And then FERC and PIMSA, so that's the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and the Pipeline Hazardous Material and Safety Administration, really have abdicated the responsibility to oversee this project. So, you know, this kind of gets at this question of can you regulate this industry? Can it be safe? I think all of us would argue no, but at the very least, you know, we, we need kind of true uh, regulators on the beat. And we're not seeing that right now. Uh, we're not, we're, we're, in, we're actually seeing the exact opposite where the Trump administration is moving forward to make it easier to transport uh, LNG by rail, to make it easier to kind of get the, this incredibly uh, dangerous uh, contaminant into our communities uh, where a disaster could happen. Um, and then this is obviously not talking about kind of the end run. So, you know, the cradle grade process it, it uh, you know, I'm not going to run through all kind of fracking. I think we're all familiar with that, but it is important to understand that the full life cycle of liquefied natural gas is incredibly environmentally damaging and has massive carbon impacts. So we're looking at obviously that first 200 miles. Um, it, there's beyond the 200 miles of wild loosing. There's the fracking that's happening in Bradford County, and then obviously once it comes to Gibbstown, you're talking about the transfer, whether it's rail or or truck, the transfer. Um, to the facility, give sound, then the transfer to the ship. And this is, I think, the thing that is incredibly important here. And I, I don't want to say exciting because nothing's exciting about this project. But what's motivating is that, you know, this ultimately is about a global campaign because this energy is being transported to New Jersey, but it is not for New Jersey. It's for a global market. So when we talk about energy independence, Really, this is about the profits of New Fortress and their desire to be able to export this uh, to a global market and specifically to Puerto Rico, where I know the, uh, you know, Jeff can reference this, but the Puerto Rico Sierra Club is, is working on this project, and then all the way to Ireland. And it's incredibly exciting to know that there are groups in Ireland, which I know uh, Food and Water Watch has been doing some work in Europe. Uh, there's uh, Clare County, which is close to where my family uh, is originally from. There's a frack free Clare County. And so I, th I think one of the things that kind of gives me hope is that we talk about the cradle grave impacts. We're talking about accountability for decision makers, not just to think about you know one location or one county, but to think about the full impacts here. And we're seeing really a global effort here to put pressure on our decision makers. So okay, that, that there's, is more, really there's more that can be talked about oh, here, but I'm probably over time. So just want to oh, pass that, the baton perfect. back to Tracy. That's perfect. Thank you, Doug. Sorry to talk over you. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to introduce Jeff Tittle, director of New Jersey Sierra Club, and he's going to pick it up um, talking about where the gas is going. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just want to start off, if you see I, pictures of my two twin grandsons, Augie and Wells, and the reason is I always want them looking over my shoulder when I talk about the environment because it's about them. Where are they going to be when they're my age 63 years from now and where will this planet be? And I think that's an important question I always want to ask myself um, as I you know, move forward with this, the work we do. Um, this is a very serious and major international industrial fossil fuel project and series of projects. And I think you have to understand that it's the fracking and wire loosing, the trucks and trains bringing it to Gibbstown and then the exporting overseas, uh, whether it's uh, Puerto Rico, Ireland, Angola, other places, wherever they can find a market. And, and it's very troubling because they have played these games. When they first came in and Sierra Club and Tracy, you know, five years ago, they went down to Gibbstown to talk about putting in a logistics center with warehouses. And then next thing you know, there was going to be some, you know, um, 
places for butane than petroleum and then natural gas liquids. And we knew all along it was going to be LNG because they were, it was in their prospectus. Um, and that's the game that they played in New Jersey and got a lot of approvals at the local level. And the same game they came, they played in Puerto Rico. They came in and they told the people down there that they were going to bring in canisters for restaurants and for food and ship it in, you know, for LNG to be like, to be used like propane. And then the next thing you know, it goes from being a small project to being an LNG port. Um, and there was a report done by Sierra Clubs, uh, some of their allies, IEF in Puerto Rico, who are fighting this. And it's a, they have a coalition of about 15 groups. Um, and what they did is they actually, you know, they actually came in and they were basically awarded a $1.5 billion contract by PURPA, which is the Puerto Rican Energy um, uh, Power Authority and um, Electric Power Authority. And it's really a scandal. Basically, they were awarded the contract before PURPA even wrote the regs for the bids to go out. And at the same time, groups like Sierra Club and others were pushing for Puerto Rico to go to 100% renewable as they were rebuilding after Maria. And so this thing is the biggest disaster for them since Maria. Uh, the other thing is that it was unsolicited. They wrote the bids for them. It was a confidentiality agreement between um, PURPA and New Fortress Energy. So couldn't even find out what's in it. Um, and instead of being this small project, all of a sudden two power plants were going to get all their natural gas through this LNG project coming from Gibstown, New Jersey. Uh, there may be even a third one where they're talking about taking another plant and converting it. It's a coal plant that's shut it down and turning it into a new gas plant. And then the next thing you know, they're telling the people in Puerto Rico, just like we're finding out about 1,600 trucks a day, potentially going into Gibstown, maybe more, that they're going to be trucking um, the LNG from San Juan to the other side of the island, you know, through the mountains and, you know, the roads in Puerto Rico, if you've been down there, aren't the greatest. Uh, sending hundreds of trucks to these different power plants to keep them uh, fed. Uh, it just it just makes absolutely no sense. Um, they said that it would you know is going to save people in Puerto Rico money. It's not true. They said it was going to be mostly backed by pub private funds. It's not true. And so this report came out that's been picked up a little bit in um, um, uh, Amy Goodman uh, uh, had it on her show, but it really hasn't gotten a lot of play in the States. But these people are playing three card Monty with people's lives down there and moving things around. And if you look at the slides, I just wanted, you know, you could see there's old town, old um, town, Puerto Rico, uh, San Juan with the ships coming in. And, you know, these, these things are dangerous. I mean, let's, you know, Doug talked a little bit about it, but when LNG tankers go into Charleston, Massachusetts, they actually put the National Guard on the bridges all over Charles River and they shut down not only bridge traffic, but also traffic in the river. Um, they actually stop planes from Logan Airport from taking off because of how dangerous this is when those ships are coming in. The same thing is going to happen to the Delaware River uh, because you know, Gibstown is within three miles of Philadelphia Airport. It has to go under, you know, the Commodore Barry Bridge and the uh, the Delaware Memorial Bridge, and then going into Old Town in Puerto Rico, um, the same thing there. And so, you know, they just gloss all this stuff over, but there's really serious consequences and problems, but yet we look the other way, and it's the same thing in New Jersey. I mean, there was an important meeting with the Coast Guard, uh, and New Jersey didn't even, DEP didn't even send anyone into that meeting a few years ago. Uh, but on the positive side, and this is going to sound kind of strange, uh, given all the problems that we have with, uh, you know, with, with government not doing their job. I mean, in New Jersey, many of the permits were given out, not all of them, the DRBC, as you know, Delaware River Keeper is fighting them. But I think one of the things that I think floored a lot of people last week was that FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, sent a letter to New Fortress Energy on, the, on Puerto Rico causing them to come in for a show clause or a cause order that they have 30 days to come in and explain why this facility that they're building in Puerto Rico does not come under FERC because based on, um, based on FERC's own rules that the, the facility that they're building there in the port um, in San Juan, you know, would be, would come in under FERC, but it just shows that this is what new fortress does. They try to get around 
regulations. They try to get around government authority. They, they hide. There's no transparency. They try to stop public input, environmental reviews. And so they're hiding from FERC because, uh, and going forward with this project without coming in because they don't want to have to potentially do an EIS and come in under NEPA or having a public comment period where the public can actually, in scoping, you know, uh, where people can actually raise issues about the environmental impacts and safety issues. And, and, that, and that's part of it. So even the Trump administration, think about it, um, has said to New Fortress Energy, you're not going to get away with playing games. You have to come in. Whereas we call FERC, the Federal Energy Rubber Stamp Commission, they're pulling back the rubber stamp and saying, you're going to have to come in and apply or show cause why you can't. And, and so I think that's um, an important part of it that, you know, also overseas, uh, you know, Ireland is debating whether or not they were going to uh, be able to take in LNG. There's a change in government that in, in Ireland is a big debate happening um, within the, within the government there on, uh, with, especially with the coalition of Sinn Féin and uh, the Green Party controlling the Irish parliament that, you know, that they're looking at not allowing LNG imports. So, you know, it's, um, again, they want to build this facility and ship this gas, and we're fighting it here, but there are people fighting in Ireland and, and many people fighting it in Puerto Rico. And I, I think that's, you know, really critical. Another thing that I, that is also, I think, important to look at the big picture, the price of gas that's been dropping. Um, there's been serious problems in the fracking industry. There's a talk about a $300 billion worth of losses into the fracking gas and oil industries uh, just, you know, recently because of the coronavirus and, and switching to cleaner fuels and I mean, to renewable energy. Um, and one of the major partners for New Fortress Energy, Chesapeake, um, just declared Chapter 11, and that was supposed to be their major supplier. So even though New Fortress Energy is put, trying to push this through, whether it's in New Jersey and the DEP or the DRBC or in Wyalusing up in Bradford County or in Puerto Rico or um, Ireland, people are fighting back and standing up. And, and that's critical because they understand that we have a climate bomb as well as these bomb trains on our road, potentially on our roads, and that we have to deal with climate change. And we have to stop LNG. It's you know, it's, it's not a bridge fuel, it's a bridge to ob oblivion. And one of the more interesting pieces that we're trying to find out more information about is that at the same time, this whole new Fortress Energy project was moving forward. Chris Christie was hired by PURPA uh, as their lobbyist to get them FEMA money and to help them uh, rebuild uh, the energy sector in uh, Puerto Rico, and we know how great, you know, Chris Christie was on the environment here in New Jersey. You know, he, you know, denied climate change. He pulled us out of Reggie. He moved our energy master plan to promoting gas. Um, and so it's sort of interesting that uh, we have, you know, our former governor now um, lobbying for PURPA to try to get the uh, PURPA's projects approved and to get them funding from the federal government for, uh, for what they're doing in Puerto Rico. And you know, I, you know, I'm just really concerned that what Chris Christie did to New Jersey, he'll end up doing to Puerto Rico and the people there have suffered enough. Um, and so, again, you know, going back to this, the whole issue is that these ships are not safe. Um, they're dangerous. They not only add to climate change, but, you know, almost 20 percent of the natural gas that they that they actually, use, you know, take in, they have to use to keep the natural gas cool to these really cold temperatures so that they don't expand and explode um to ship the transshipment of it and, and and then you know bring you know it makes absolutely no sense it is really you know one of the worst ideas and the worst places at the worst time i could ever think of and uh but i think that even FERC has said wait a second but more importantly, we have to get New Jersey and the DRBC to also say this project is wrong and we need to work with the people, whether it's in Puerto Rico or Ireland or in Bradford County, to stop this madness before it continues uh, to go forward. And we have a good chance to stop it. I think this letter from FERC, to me, is a sign that these, they may have overstepped their bounds and now's the time to really fight and stop them. And I will end there. Thank everyone for being on, on this and we'll continue our battles. Thank you, Jeff. So I'd like to introduce Jocelyn Sawyer from Food and Water Action, and she's gonna talk about climate impacts. Thank you so much, Tracy. 
Um, yeah, this is a, a chart here in this first slide that I know is familiar to a lot of people on this call, um, just about the climate tipping points that we are approaching. The science is abundantly clear that we really cannot afford to exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming. Um, and to avoid the worst impacts of climate change, we need to be rapidly shifting to renewable energy starting now and within the next 10 years. Um, for folks on the phone, we've got the classic hockey stick chart here just showing the, the projected current warming rate um, if we continue business as usual. Um, and unfortunately, New Jersey is continuing business as usual. Um, I'm speaking New Jersey specific because I, I work in New Jersey. It's a South Jersey organizer, but uh, Pennsylvania has certainly been um, welcoming to the fracking industry too. Um, Governor Murphy talks a big game on climate, but there are over a dozen fossil fuel projects moving forward in the state. And this is just, as others have said, just one piece of a massive project and an, a international puzzle building out fossil fuels in this area. Um, and so just to give a little bit more context on, on what's going on with this project, this is about making profits for the failing fracking industry. Fracking has not been profitable. Um, as Jeff has said, there, we've been seeing a domestic gas glut since actually 2014 with the rapid expansion of fracking. The supply currently far exceeds the demand um, domestically. And while gas is touted as a cheap energy source, that is a problem for the fracking industry because they are not making money. Um, and the industry continues to push full steam ahead anyway. And governors in New Jersey and Pennsylvania just continue to, to rubber stamp it. Um, and so as the industry has failed to turn profits, selling gas for power in the US, they've turned to three main new horizons for how to profit off of this fracking, manufactured fracking boom. And those are gas-fired power plants, and then also exporting LNG for energy and for plastics, which is what we're seeing here. And this scope of this story is just is important to understand the full impact of, of the climate impacts here, because it's not just about burning natural gas for power and the energy emissions. Um, it really is about the cradle to grave impacts. And so uh, we are seeing right now actually a boom with LNG export. In 2018, there were three LNG export facilities operating, but 22 that had been approved and another 20 pending federal review. Um, and even still, Prices, prices are collapsing. Um, they were collapsing. They were at a 10 year low even before the, the pandemic. Now we're seeing projects being canceled. This is a total economic disaster, but still the industry is forging um, ahead. And the fracking boom has led to an oversupply of cheap ethane, which is a main ingredient in plastic. And the chemical sector is actually the biggest industrial consumer of fossil fuels, more than trucking, shipping, and aviation. Um, plastics were responsible for almost 4% of global emissions in 2015. So this is a bigger impact on climate than I think, than we often talk about and then people realize. And so just in summary, that the, the point of this project is to get Pennsylvania fracked gas to new markets so the industry can justify more fracking. Um, and here in particular for energy exports for plastics. And so as we see in this little chart here, fracking is a total climate disaster, regardless of the end goal of how the gas ends up being used. Um, we, we know CO2 is the greenhouse gas we hear about the most, but remember that methane is over 86 times as potent over the short term, which is what's, again, critically important when we're looking at, at minimizing climate impacts. Um, burning gas for power releases methane, but so does just the process of fracking. Methane leaks occur throughout the natural gas supply chain, um, and it's especially egregious in the shale fields. Um, recent studies have found that gas leaks out from old oil wells through cracks in the surface, um, through leaky well casings due to the high pressure used in fracking, um, from wastewater flowback, old repurposed storage tanks, trucks and barges during transportation. So we will be seeing methane leakages at every point in this project if it is built. 
Um, and if there were any climate benefits for gas over coal, the leakage during this process and the methane that's emitted just from fracking makes it makes gas worse. Um, so just anything that is entrenching fracking in our region and building out this southeastern PA South Jersey gas hub is a disaster for climate. Um, but with the industry in such economic shambles, we could be at a turning point here. Um, we need to ban fracking and we need a Green New Deal for New Jersey. Um, the great news is that the technology exists to switch to renewables, um, especially with the electricity sector, we can do that. And um, we just need the political will for policies that mandate that switch and that don't artificially inflate prices and keep propping up the failing gas industry. And New Jersey has amazing potential for offshore wind. Um, last year, Murphy announced a deal to bring 1,100 megawatts of offshore wind uh, to a wind farm off the coast of Atlantic City. This photo we're looking at here is a projection of what that could look like from an Atlantic City beach. Um, and that's aiming to power half a million homes by 2025. And of course, uh, just very recently, Murphy announced plans for a wind port to, as he says, position New Jersey as a hub for the US offshore wind industry, um, which is amazing. But the irony is that if that site is built at the, at the location that he's proposed, and if the Skibstown terminal goes forward, then you'll have barges carrying LNG ships passing right by the wind port. And so while talking a big game on climate, um, by playing into Trump's energy schemes and pushing forward this, the Gibstown LNG terminal, uh, Murphy's efforts on wind power are, are basically canceled out. Um, so we, we absolutely need a Green New Deal for this region. We need a moratorium on new fossil fuel projects and expansions of programs like community solar and municipal energy aggregation that lets towns choose clean energy sources and certainly offshore wind and offshore wind jobs in South Jersey. Um, we should be the U.S. hub for offshore wind industry and not a hub for international fracked gas disaster zone. Um, okay, thank you very much, Jocelyn. I appreciate that. And we're now going to move, before we go to our, um, our question and answer period, we're going to move to the map that I want to introduce. Now, this is good, just going to be a brief introduction of an interactive map that Delaware Riverkeeper Network has commissioned. Frack Tracker in Pennsylvania um, made this map for us and um, we designed into it the things that we wanted to show by showing the route from Wyalusing, PA, which is right up here, to Gibbstown, New Jersey, which is down here. So first, um, I wanna say that this is on our website right now, so you can play around with it and look at it. But to start out, I wanna show you that over here on the left, there's a panel. And on that panel, it shows right now the layers. And there's various layers that you can put um, on and off in order to take a close look at this project. Um, right now, what you're looking at is the route itself. And it's showing from very high up a two, a two mile, uh, what we call a high hazard zone on each side of the highway or the train tracks. And that two mile high hazard zone um, is the area that would be first impacted and the most greatly impacted. It doesn't mean that outside of that two mile high hazard zone, it's safe. As Doug discussed earlier, we don't know and there's been no uh, modern modeling to show exactly how far a, an explosion of LNG would move and that's partly because of the nature of LNG. It could move as a cloud along, for instance, a hollow or a ditch for miles before it reaches an ignition source. It could get caught in a storm sewer and explode even without an ignition source. And that could affect several miles outwards from where the explosion occurs. So at the Gibbstown Logistics Center itself, it's extremely hazardous. The most dangerous part of handling and moving LNG is when you transload it from one container into another. And Delaware River Partners, of the subsidiary of New Fortress Energy, is making that a 365-day perpetual transloading project. They're taking it directly from those train cars and those trucks onto the ship. So they're always transloading. 
So that's, that's, that's what would happen if you were to see um, an accident right there. But what about along the, the, this route here? What would happen? Well, we're showing the two mile area because we, we want to explain that, that what's in that two mile area. And if you take a look at, for instance, um, Philadelphia, let's right here, you can take, type in Philadelphia, and Philadelphia will come up. And right now, I have the rail route showing, and the bubbles are all public schools, all private schools, and all childcare centers. And then if we move, if I move down on this panel over here on the left, and uh, I right now have the minority population areas and their population density per square mile uh, clicked on the layer. So I'm showing that, That's, those are those dark rosy areas. And if we zoom in, we can get a better look. As a matter of fact, you can look up your very own house on here. It will zoom all the way down and show you not only the route that the, that the, uh, that the rail route is going, which you can see right here, the rail route is moving across the Schuylkill River. Sorry, it's a little slow loading. It, it crosses the Schuylkill River and then it crosses into Philadelphia. Here's the two mile route. These are the areas with the high, with uh, showing the minority population areas and their population density. You can actually click on a spot and information will come up to show you exactly what, where that spot is, and you'll be able to get the actual um, population density from the census for the census block for that area. But zooming back out, there it is right there, minority population for rail route A, which is the most likely rail route they would take, is uh, 1,083 people, and the density per square mile is 13,500, and 38 people. That's the number of people in that two mile area that could be impacted should there be a derailment and a fire or explosion. So moving back out a little bit so you can uh, get a, a picture of exactly where this route goes. It, after it crosses the, the bridge at Fairmont Park and crosses into Philadelphia, it then Philadelphia, the center of Philadelphia is impacted as you can see with the two mile high hazard zone mapped out, all of these areas here would be impacted. So if you live over this way, um, you would see 22,939 people at this location that could potentially be impacted, um, it, should there be a derailment at that spot. And then if I zoom in a little closer, I just wanna show you that you can actually look at exactly what street it's going down and you can look at, you can actually find you know, your cross street. So then as the, I'm gonna zoom back out now, um, the other layer is the low income layer. So when you click on the low income area and their population density per square mile, it amplifies even more that minority populations and the poor are the most impacted by the way that this route will, um, is planned. And then if I move out a little bit, I wanna show you that what happens as it leaves Philadelphia, is it crosses the river at the, on the Del Air Bridge. And the Del Air Bridge um, goes over to New Jersey, across the Delaware River into Pennsauken. And as it goes into Pennsauken, it turns and it moves, sorry, it's taking a little time to load, but it moves and turns south. And that is a freight rail track. And it's been used historically, they're old tracks, 100 years old. It's been used historically for the refineries that operated along the Delaware River, for the DuPont facility where the Gibbs pipeline was going in, a highly polluted site, still polluted and still supposedly under remediation, even though they're building on it this moment. Um, and uh, it went down, it goes all the way down to the DuPont Chambers Works facility in Salem County in Deepwater. So this is a traditional old South Jersey rail track. It goes right through Camden. And if you wanna look at the, uh, you know, take a closer look at Camden, you can see 
the population areas that will be most affected within the two mile. They're highly minority populations. And then also, if I click on the layer for low income, also the poor. And then as you move further south, I'm gonna zoom it out a little bit. Um, it moves down along the Delaware River. And then of course, it uh, travels on down to Gibbstown. It goes through um, several other minority um, and environmental justice areas, such as outside of Camden, such as um, Woodbury and, and Paulsboro, um, which is the closest, um, it's not as dense as Chester, um, but it is a, um, an environmental justice community, and it is the uh, just about uh, four miles, three and a half miles. Uh, it's not as, quite as close as Chester, um, but it is right there. Um, and of course, it's not only next to this facility um, here in Gibbstown, but it's also along the route. So you see Paulsboro here. If I unclick, you can see the low income and then also the minority populations. So I, I really just wanted to introduce this and let you know that it is a tool. Um, we're going to be doing a report that kind of crunches the, what we've learned. Um, we also have um, static maps. And I want to show you um, just on our website, we do have the static maps, if I can pull them up. Uh, I have to go to my, bear with me for a minute. Oh well, all right, it's not gonna let me bring them up, but I do want you to know that there's a link right on our very top of supporting documents under our webpage on the Gibbstown uh, proposed LNG export terminal. It's the first thing there and it says static maps. And those maps are really good because they'll give you a good picture sort of, you know, from a, from, a far up uh, perspective of what the route is. And then there's also a blow up or an inset of the Philadelphia and New Jersey area where the Gibbstown facility is. So we are going to be having a webinar on this um, and we'll be announcing that sometime uh, probably in a couple of weeks where we just use the maps and talk about the maps um, in order for people to become a little more familiar with them. But I think the big story here is that the bomb trains and the bomb trucks that New Fortress Energy is bringing to this site will go through hundreds of communities and more people of color and poor people will be exposed to the risk of a train derailment or a truck accident. And I think that's significant because it has not been taken into consideration by any government agency. I would also like to say that when you look at these layers over here, you'll see there's four different routes. One is this train route that we just looked at. Then there's a train route B, which goes closer to Trenton. And the, uh, the minority populations and the poor people in Trenton are also aggregated right around within that two mile high hazard zone. Um, and then also the truck route, um, there's two of them and the, uh, those truck routes also travel um, you know, from Wyalusing across the landscapes of Pennsylvania and then down into, um, into Gibbstown. And they go through a lot of populated areas. And I think you know, probably the most important thing that we need to realize is that because of the secretive nature of New Fortress Energy, Delaware River Partners, and the representatives of New Fortress Energy and Wyalusing, we don't really know exactly what they're going to be doing. That's why we have four of these routes. Um, they, they're not required by law to, to disclose these exact routes. There's so much that is sh shielded um, and given a cloak of secrecy by government agencies, and then on such as uh, the Pipeline Hazardous Material and Safety Administration and the Department of Transportation, which don't allow these routes um, for the, that the trains will take to be disclosed to the public because they say it's a homeland security issue. To, and then we uh, layered on top of that, we have Delaware River Partners and New Fortress Energy, but you think they're not doing what they're doing. Um, they do everything they can to avoid regulation. They have uh, actually given different stories to different agencies. So, Often it's not only the public that doesn't know, but even the agencies that are supposed to be regulating this don't know. 
that's one of the reasons why we think we, we have why we think we have a very very good chance of beating this project at the Delaware River Basin Commission level because that agency did not know a lot of the things that came out during the hearing that was held in May. So at this time, I'd like to open it up to questions and answers. And uh, Peter Tran from Delaware Riverkeeper Network has been looking at the, uh, at the uh, chat box. And um, Peter, are you gonna be able to uh, read the uh, questions that people have asked into us so we can try to answer? Sure. Um, so I think we have one question from, um, let's see, um, let me just scroll back up here, um, from Kristen James asking, um, which are the three major permits DRN is appealing? Okay, so the first one is the approval by the Delaware River Basin Commission, which was the first permit that was given for the project. That was given in June of last year, one year ago. And so we, we uh, did uh, appeal that. The hearing has already occurred. And we're gonna talk about actions in a minute, but you'll, you'll hear about an action that we're taking in order to try to have public input into the decision that's gonna be made by the Delaware River Basin Commission about whether or not um, that uh, permit will stand. Uh, they did agree, the uh, voting members of the Delaware River Basin Commission, um, to reconsider the approval by holding a hearing that we had asked for, which was what occurred in May. The second permit is the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection permit. It's called a waterfront development permit. That permit implements the coastal zone management regulations and also the Flood Hazard Act. And it also uh, includes the water quality certificate, um, which many of you on this call probably know about. Um, and the, that certificate comes automatically with that approval. Uh, we have filed an appeal of that as, when it was given, and we're in the process now of, of doing our court filings. And then the third permit, which is the other major permit that they need for this project, is the Army Corps of Engineers. And they um, gave their approval, um, and that was at the end of February. And um, we did appeal that, and that has, is just beginning to go through the courts. That was the last one that was given. So those none of those three permits um, can are good without the others. So uh, the Delaware River Basin Commission can stop the, per, the whole project. The Army Corps of Engineers, um, their permit is essential, and New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, their permit is essential. There's a lot of other permits associated with this, wetlands permits, and uh, there's a, a a Route 44 bypass they have to build. There's a lot of permits associated with that that would bypass the road that goes right through the center of Gibbstown in order to get all these trucks in there. Um, and the rail tracks also go right through the middle of, of Gibbstown uh, through the residential community. Um, so th th there's several permits there that um, are you know, probably 10 different ones, but the linchpin permits are the ones that we are appealing. Okay. so. Um, we have another question from Corey Bishop asking, what is Blevy? And I think maybe Doug wants to, could talk about that, if he's still here. Yeah, can you spell that? What did you say? B-L-E-V-E. -E. Oh, Blevy. Doug, are you there? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Tracy, can you, can you take that? Yeah, it's, a, it's, uh, it's short for a, a boiling liquid, um, well, anyway, what happened? I'll tell you what it is. It's when LNG is released, it can get caught into a, a covered area and it can actually boil furiously and explode on its own, even without an ignition source. They, you know, Fred Millar, who's a consultant that Doug mentioned, um, talks about how uh, PIMSA and um, the DOT all denied for years that blevies could occur as a result of LNG releases, but they have occurred. They've occurred overseas and they've been devastating when they have occurred. I think one of the things that, um, that is associated um, with this property of LNG is that when a blevy or um, 
a release does ignite, it has the power of what, very similar to what's called a thermobaric bomb. That's why these are called bomb trains. That's why they're called bomb trucks, because it actually is like a bomb. Um, when the LNG is released, you can't stop it. It comes out really fast. And that is when, that's why it's so dangerous. There's no way to mitigate it. And all you can do is evacuate if there's a fire or try to evacuate where the cloud is moving so you don't get caught in that levee. It, it stands for a boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion. Thank you. Because I couldn't it, remember all, all, all of those words. Yeah, because it's so cold um, uh, that it actually boils at very low temperatures. There was um, years ago, one of the big battles against LNG back in the late 70s and early 80s, they wanted to build floating LNG terminals in, in the New York Bight off of Manhattan. And they were, because of the cold water in the wintertime, they were afraid that a leak would actually continue as a, as a, as a fog along the water and get into Manhattan until it created a, 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 a levee that could have actually destroyed Manhattan and it's lower Manhattan. So, you know, these things are serious and real. Okay, we have other questions? Okay, I think um, we are running low on time. So I think maybe um, we'll try to do one more question and then if we wanna move forward with that, then we can. Um, we have a question about um, Homeland Security. Um, there is a person asking, um, following 9-11, there were tremendous oversight of bridges, tunnels, roadways, and railways from the perspective of, home, of Homeland Security. What Homeland Security measures have been proposed for the transport of LNG? And is it possible to hold this, um, this project from going forward if um, there are no Homeland Security measures in place. Well, um, there have been no risk assessments done at the national, at the federal level. And that's one of the good reasons that there's probably going to be a, an appeal of that rule that I just mentioned, where LNG can be moved across all of the nation's tracks now, um, because they uh, because they have not done that in order to put in place these types of safety measures. Um, but in addition to that, um, New Fortress Energy is obviously a favorite of uh, the federal government because they got this special permit. And this, this special permit does require them to give some information to PIMSA, the Pipeline Hazardous Materials Safety Administration, before they actually start moving LNG by rail. Um, however, um, the, the couple of things that they have to do is do some training of emergency management, management response. And you know, according to all the experts that we have spoken to, that's, that's like you're letting the horse out of the barn uh, and then you're trying to close the door because you don't do that after you give a permit. And you certainly don't let that per planning go forward by, an, by a company that thinks they're gonna be able to use it by slapping a few um, training programs in place. Typically those training pro programs for crude oil, uh, when they were using, uh, you know, cr crude by rail was so big, um, they, they would just be, you know, either a one night, uh, a couple hour training session or maybe a virtual you know webinar it wasn't an extensive training session and fire companies that i spoke to during that uh fight said we just evacuate and get out of the way because we don't believe there's any safety measures at all in place here so those those kind of measures have not been taken um with this the other thing i'd just like to mention is that the the approval that was just given for uh, rail cars across the nation um, is going to require uh, a heavier um, jacket, on, a steel jacket on the outside of the rail car, but that's not what's required for this special permit. So they have even less that they're going to be doing for this project than the minimum that they're requiring for the LNG by rail across the nation. It's but absolutely it, unjust. There is uh, some. There is. There's going to have to be a plan, especially for the transshipment of. of for the LNG through the harbor and down the river. And normally they will, the Coast Guard will be involved in that and they will do things like clo close all boat traffic when those ships are moving uh, out of port 
um, they would probably close the bridges and potentially close the airport. Those are the measures that are being taken by Homeland Security and the Coast Guard in Boston Harbor, where the National Guard stands on you know, the bridges. And, uh, and I think that's one of the other areas to fight this is because when, if they're going to be shipping things as much as they say they're going to be doing, it's going to have a big impact on travel uh, in the region. Could you imagine a ship coming through at rush hour going under the Delaware Memorial Bridge and it has to be closed for a half hour or 40 minutes for that to pass through uh, with the National Guard deployed? Uh, or even potentially Philadelphia Airport, because it's only three miles away, would have to be shut down, no takeoffs or landings during the, the shipping process. So those are some big issues that government haven't even started to look at that are really important when you're dealing with something that's, you know, this explosion, explosive. I mean, even the Trump administration says that these facilities should be located in rural areas two miles away from the nearest residents, and yet we're putting it right in the middle of one of the most congested areas of the country. And and have a big impact not only on the people around it, but on, on our economy, because if they have to shut down shipping, if they have to shut down the airport, uh, bridges and everything else, it's going to have a big impact. Yeah, I think the important thing about that is sort of the same thing. They're giving the go-aheads for this project before they've even looked at that. As a matter of fact, in the most recent Freedom of Information Act request that we filed with the Coast Guard just uh, within you know, the last couple of weeks, they haven't even applied for the approval to move mm -hmm. LNG down the Delaware River yet. So this is how they do this. They try to fly under the radar, they wait until the last minute, they put on a lot of pressure, and they hope nobody finds out about it. Well, we found out about it, we're not gonna let it happen. But uh, we're at the end of our, um, of our time, but I do wanna say you know, a couple things. We, have, we, we do have a fight here, and there's a lot of people that are involved in it. You heard about Ireland, you heard about Puerto Rico, um, you heard about Waya Loosing. There's a big fight going on up there. People have organized a new organization. Um, and we really want to spread the word about what is planned for the transportation route. So we are when we have our webinar on the map, we're hoping that people will want to sign up to get involved if you see that your community is in the path of this. Um, we, could, we have several different um, actions that we can take such as resolutions against it in your town um, and also we want to notify the schools um, that they are in the path of danger and because everybody um, th there's really nobody that knows about this everybody is in the dark um, the other thing is that we are really targeting the delaware river basin commission because they are the ones that gave the first permit and got this whole thing going they rushed it through with only a, a few days notice all of us came out and screamed at them to stop. They refused to, and it was all over within a week. And outrageous as that seems, that from the time they had the hearing and the time they voted, they had, uh, it was less than a week. And that's why I think they gave us, um, you know, they, they, they voted to uh, reconsider their approval because they were in a very weak legal position. But I think, you know, as we go forward, what we have decided as a coalition of groups is to target them with a petition campaign. So we have a serious effort to try to get tens of thousands of names on petitions to hand into the Delaware River Basin Commission because they are going to have to vote as members of the Delaware River Basin Commission about whether or not they are going to accept the report that comes out of the hearing officer who oversaw the hearing or not. They basically can take into consideration the public and what we say to them about what the public wants when they do their vote. And we know that the members of the DRBC, which are the governors of the four states, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, and Delaware, and the Army Corps of Engineers, we know that they have responded to the public in the past. This is our strongest position. It's a strategy that we're playing out over the summer. We have launched the petition already. It is on Delaware Riverkeeper Network's um, homepage. If you go to it, there's flames and you click on that and you can sign it. You can share it with other people. Every organization involved is uh, issuing their own um, uh, petition platform. We're all using the same wording. So Food and Water Action and uh, uh, New Jersey Sierra Club, uh, Delaware Sierra Club, Environment New Jersey, all of the organ of Clean Water Action. And all of the groups that I mentioned earlier will all be issuing their own petitions 
on their own platforms and we'll be out there through Action Network and Move On, um, you know, Better Path Coalition. Um, they're putting out a, a, a petition for us. So we have a lot of venues and we have the opportunity to get a volume of people to speak to the DRBC. So they hear the people and they know we do not want this project to move ahead. And we want a, a green recovery from COVID. We want a green new deal that replaces these dirty fossil fuels with clean, truly clean and renewable energy. And we want it now. We don't want this project to move ahead. This kind of infrastructure stays in place for a very long time. We don't want to seal that fate. So we, we really encourage anybody who has an organization at, with the ability to share the petition to please do that. We're having a full court press to get as many as we possibly can. Um, and then we'll also be having, and then the deadline for the petition will be when the commission is going to be voting on this, which we expect to be probably in August or September, towards the end of August or September. It could be later. We don't know because of the way the courts are set, the court is set up. Um, but we do have um, a couple months to really get volume of signatures. And as we do that, we're raising we're raising people's awareness and getting them involved. Um, the other thing is that we will be having other webinars um, and we're going to have them throughout the summer. We have several topics that we're going to be doing. Um, Jeff is going to be inviting in somebody uh, who's very involved in leading the Puerto Rico fight. They're going to be on. We're going to have some of the folks that we're working with in Ireland. Um, they're going to be, we'll have a special webinar with them. Um, you know, we'll have the folks from Wyalusing, we'll have folks from different places on these webinars over the summer in order to spread the word and just shout as loud as we can that this project's going forward. Um, and and we, we want it to stop. Um, so that's about it. Does anybody, any of our other panelists have any of act, other actions before we go that you'd like to you know, bring up? We did send a sign on letter that all of us worked on and many people on this webinar tonight are probably, um, organization representatives that signed on to that letter. We had 128 organizations sign on to a letter that was sent to the Delaware River Basin Commission saying, we want this project stopped. And they represent collectively almost a million members. So we've already given the shot across the bow. We want to follow it up with those individual petition signatures. Um, so I'd also like to say that next Tuesday, Better Path Coalition is hosting um, a webinar on this topic with myself and Diana Dakey from Protect Northern PA, which is the new group that's formed in Wyalusing. So you're invited to, do, to join us there too. Go to Better Path Coalition website. Um, so we, any other questions we didn't answer, we're going to respond to um, by email. We're also going to be sending out links to the interactive map, to the static maps, the pictures, uh, to the petition, if you don't want to go to our website, or I think maybe uh, Jeff and Jocelyn might already have their petitions up on their websites too. But if you don't want to, we're also going to be sending a link out to that. And also, I'll be sending my email address with that in case anybody has any questions, any ideas, um, or wants to get involved in um, thinking through the strategy to fight this horrible project. Okay, anything else from Jocelyn, Jeff, or Doug? Just thanks, every, thanks everybody for coming on and we've got a lot of work ahead of us, but like everything else, when we stick together and we fight hard, we win. So thank you. Okay. And then just, just to echo that point, uh, Tracy and Jeff, uh, you know, I know a lot of you represent organizations that have signed on to that letter. If you haven't, please do so. And more importantly, share within your communities um, you know, that this is a, you know, kind of education is, is job number one. Uh, to make sure that people know that this is coming. And I, I saw in the chat, uh, you know, a reference to someone that, that lives two miles from one of the routes. I think the more people know that you literally could have bomb trains and bomb trucks uh, coming through their hometowns, uh, that's really gonna ignite a, a, a good fire on our side. So thank you all for, for joining. Okay, thank you all. And as we uh, investigate the supply chain and fight it from cradle to grave, we're, we hope you're going to be there with us. Thanks for uh, taking an hour and 15 minutes out of your time. Thank you. Thank you so much.